This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Isabel Sheets. I'm from the Department of Social Policy at the London School of Economics across the roads. Um, I'm delighted to be here today to introduce the uh, second in the lecture series that Professor Robin Gould is giving. So uh, just to say a few words about the New Zealand-UK Link Foundation on behalf of Sir Graham Davies, the chair of the foundation, who apologises he was unable to um, attend uh, the lecture today. Uh, the New Zealand-UK Link Foundation's purpose is to make an ongoing and substantial contribution to the intellectual, educational, vocational and academic underpinning of the bilateral New Zealand-UK relationship in the changing world. The foundation is a registered charity and its trustees aim to forge lasting and important links between academics, policy makers, business leaders, researchers and others who are working at the cutting edge in the fields. Uh, uh, in, their, uh, in each of uh, those countries. In 2010, the Link Foundation launched its visiting professorship program, and since then, there have been a range of distinguished experts uh, from diverse fields uh, involved in the program. The Foundation's visiting professorship program was developed in collaboration with Sir Graham Davies while he was Vice Chancellor at London University and who's now, who is now the Foundation's Chair. The link was also supported by Professor Philip Murphy, Director of the University's School of Advanced Study. And as I say, uh, Sir Graham, unfortunately, is un unable to uh, attend this afternoon um, and is sorry to be uh, missing this afternoon's debate. So I'll just say a few words by way of introduction to um, the, uh, the lecture um, and introduce you to our panel of speakers. So Robin's lecture today will look at the movement of healthcare professionals between the UK and New Zealand. New Zealand being a major importer of healthcare professionals. Robin is Professor of Health Policy at the Department of Preventive and Social Medicine and Director of the Centre for Health Systems at the University of Otago. He's a leading scholar and authority on healthcare systems whose recent book, The New Health Policy, was awarded first prize in the health and social care category at the 2010 BMA Medical Book Awards. Other recent publications include Revolving Doors, New Zealand's Health Reforms, The Continuing Saga, Healthcare Systems in Asia and Europe, and Democratic Governance in Health, as well as a prolific uh, number of um, journal articles. He's been a senior fellow at the Boston University Health Policy Institute and was a Commonwealth Fund Harkness Fellow in 2008 to 2009, working with colleagues from Boston and Harvard Universities. He's also previously held posts at the University of Hong Kong and City University of Hong Kong and at the University of Texas and Harvard. As I say, Robin's lecture will focus on migration of healthcare professionals from the UK to New Zealand and will examine what drives this flow and the motivations and experiences of these workers and, of course, the implications for healthcare systems in both countries. His lecture will be followed by a response uh, from Professor Jill Manthorpe with respect to international migration and the social care sector in the UK, and by Professor Stephen Back, who will address the wider context of international migration of healthcare professionals. We'll then have a panel discussion, uh, which will be followed by a drinks reception, to which you're all welcome to uh, attend. So before giving the floor to Robin, I'll just say a few words on uh, the important questions and issues that his research addresses. The migration of health and social care workers in a global context brings together a number of important changes 
uh, that have taken place since the post-war era of the so-called classic welfare states, which in this country was marked, of course, by the development of the National Health Service and by the development of the post personal uh, social services. So those shifts firstly concern the ongoing restructuring of health and social care systems alongside wider welfare state reforms, which have involved changes in the roles and relations between the public and the private, uh, both in the financing, provision and regulation of healthcare systems. Changes that have shaped the structure of the workforce in those systems and the challenges facing the workforce in different ways. Secondly, there's been a significant increase in international migration since the post-war period and an increase in the diversity of migration patterns that we see, affecting both high-income countries and low-income countries across the world. Likewise, there's been a major expansion of systems designed to control the flow of migration across countries. The policies of high-income countries such as the UK and New Zealand have been increasingly aimed at facilitating high-skilled forms of migration. <clears throat> Both countries operate a points-based system aimed at attracting the highly skilled, notwithstanding, of course, the significance of migrant labour in both highly skilled professions and in lower skilled forms of uh, work, such as agency work. So the health and social care workforce has been shaped by these two institutional contexts, health and social care policies on the one hand and immigration policies on the other. Those systems and policies interact, but not necessarily in a coordinated fashion, and there are often tensions between the two. Questions about migrant workers, as our speakers will address, are often framed in policy debates with regard to a need for migrant workers from the perspective of high-income countries. To what extent are migrant workers a means to addressing staff shortages facing health and social care systems, or to facilitating the expansion of the workforce in those countries, versus how far should those systems become more self-sufficient? But health worker migration has also required us to think outside the national boundaries of welfare states, bringing attention to the needs of the countries of origin of migrant workers with regards to the impact of health worker migration on those countries in terms of a so-called brain drain, for example, and how healthcare migration can enable a transfer of knowledge across countries. And it also requires us to consider the needs and motivations, of course, of the health workers themselves and their families, who may or may not migrate with them. Issues which uh, Robin's lecture and research um, have addressed in detail. Migration flows are both temporary and permanent, but they're shaped not simply by immigration or healthcare policies, but by the motivations and experiences of the workers themselves. So I'll now hand over to Robin. Thank you. Well, thanks uh, uh, very much, Isabel. Kia ora koutou. It's a real privilege and honour to be here at King's College tonight, uh, talking on this very, very important topic of health care workforce and social care workforce and migration. I just want to thank a few people before I go on. Um, thanks enormously, you know, Isabel for cheering and coming along here tonight for your introduction. Thanks hugely to the NZ UK Link Foundation. This is a wonderful, wonderful organisation and to um, get the backing and support of such an organisation to be doing what I'm doing here. Uh, it is very difficult to put into words, so thank you so much. Thanks Lisa, that we feature as the chief organiser of the foundation. I said this last week. If you want anything administrative done, Lisa is 158% reliable. So thank you Lisa, fantastic. Um, thanks very much to Kings for um, hosting the event. Thanks very much to Jill Manfield and to Jess Harris for helping with the mechanics behind the scenes. Thanks to the School of Advanced Study, which is not having a space here. And thanks to you for coming along. It's just, just done happen without willing participants. So thanks to each and every one of you for being here. So um, just in terms of the importance of this topic tonight, to put it into context, I've actually been researching this now for a few months. And I did not foresee that this newspaper, which I know we all pay close attention to, would have this headline only two weeks ago. 610,000 pounds each train, but 3,000 a year going to the southern of Australia. 
Australia and into New Zealand. About 500 of them attempt to go to New Zealand, and most are successful in that. Here's where they might go to. This is Dunedin, New Zealand, where I live. Uh, now, you know, I think you're going to some. Anyone here know Dunedin? I know one person has lived in Dunedin. Uh, it might look like this, but it could be 14 degrees at least. You might go say like yesterday now and then, in the summer. <laughs> Um, it's a gorgeous, gorgeous place to live. This is the beach that borders the city, uh, and it's also the furthest city in the world from London. It's a very, very long way away. Marvellous place to live. Now, this is why medical migration has been in the news. This is the General Medical Council's report now, uh, or I think it'll be an annual report into the state of the medical workforce, essentially. Very, very interesting read this report. And very aware is a bit of information about medical migration. And um, in this report, they said that 51% of their certificates of good standing were sent to addresses in Australia and New Zealand. So one would assume that when you're requesting one of these certificates, you're going to be applying for medical registration practice in those countries. Now, this is down from the 61% of 2008, but still a considerable proportion of those certificates being issued to doctors wanting to go to the sun, essentially, in this domain. Now, uh, our own medical council in New Zealand, in response to the media stories of a couple of weeks ago, uh, put together a bit of data uh, and a summary of that data suggesting that the inflows into New Zealand could be starting to taper off. Through very early, but it's just anecdotally, I think the inflows have been slow. Of course, there is concern here about medical migrants leaving the country to part in the NHS, the loss of another 610,000 pounds of training at expertise. Really, for New Zealand, the challenges are far, far greater. Uh, we are the highest importer of medical professionals in the OECD, have been for a long time. We are near highest for nurses. We are also, uh, I think, still the highest exporter of doctors as well in the OECD. Our healthcare system really relies on IMGs, as we call them, international medical graduates. Without whom, our healthcare system just would not function. The turnover rate, however, for IMGs is higher than it is for locally trained medical graduates, and I'll come on to that shortly and show some data on the turnover rates. This uh, revolving door, as some call it, uh, really comes at tremendous cost for our healthcare system. Uh, many of the IMGs who come to New Zealand do so to take up short term appointments, uh, to fill perhaps a local place for a year. Many depart quite quickly uh, after gaining their registration in New Zealand. And then a local is required to fill that space at great cost. Um, there are, of course, recruiting costs uh, for doctors coming from abroad. Our district health boards, I don't know how much they spend, but a considerable proportion of money goes to recruiting costs for each doctor. And then, of course, the IMGs all require supervision from the medical council. And so this places an additional pressure on uh, medical specialists and GPs in New Zealand in terms of providing that supervision to IMGs. So this is the menu ahead. Uh, I don't know about gross land, but I couldn't help but put that in. And um, I apologize to people hearing them in the room. And you can't get a picture of New Zealand without the gross land. I don't know if you get, in Hong Kong actually, you can get um, vegetarian gross meat. I don't know if you still can, it's made of yeah, that kind of really thing kind of stuff. Um, so my wife, who at that stage was a um, strict vegetarian, used to eat this kind of Hong Kong style vegetarian gross land. That's a side story, I shouldn't digress. Um, so, just a little bit about New Zealand, the country, and the healthcare system, then uh, some data on medical migration, uh, then research into medical migration from the UK to New Zealand, the research that I conducted and I'm going to present here tonight for the first time, uh, then a little bit about the policy settings in New Zealand, and a bit of history around that and some conclusions. And I should just add that I'm talking specifically about medical migration. I have been looking at the nursing workforce as well, and then I've looked also at migrants who come to the UK, but I'm going to talk specifically about the flow to New Zealand, just given the media attention recently and within France so tonight, um, of time tonight. So New Zealand, in terms of the country, we're a mid-range economy. Uh, we are not as wealthy in terms of GDP per capita uh, measure than US dollars that purchase in kind of parity. We are a very diverse, uh, sorry, dispersed population, uh, four and a half million people, about half the population of metropolitan London, dispersed over the entire country. One third of the population live in the Auckland metropolitan area. 
One quarter live in the entire South Island. Uh, one third of the South Islanders live in Christchurch City. So you can see how, how, how dispersed uh, and um, distant from one another people can be. Um, last year's census showed that one quarter of New Zealanders now were born outside of the country. There's been quite a, a rapid shift uh, in the statistic in New Zealand. And so we now have a very globalised population. Um, in terms of healthcare, we have uh, inequality and in life expectancy and burden of disease disproportionately falling on uh, Māori people and Pacific people especially. Uh, life expectancies are, are quite, uh, there is quite a gap between Pacific and Māori people and other New Zealanders. Um, our total health expenditure now is above the OECD average and above that of the UK, which is about the OECD average. Our government is the major spender as it is here and we spend about exactly the same as, the, as is spent by the government here, 83% of the total. Um, our funding in real terms has been dropping since 2009, placing pressure on the healthcare system, but our economy, unlike Europe, has actually um, it, it, it struggled a bit for a year or two, but it's been growing ever since. And so recent analysis suggests that our healthcare system would be considering, considerably better off if the investment in healthcare by our government and by our private expenditure as well had kept pace with general GDP growth. Healthcare is a major employer in New Zealand, 4.575% of New Zealanders are employed in the healthcare system. On to the health system itself, it was founded in the principles, the contemporary healthcare system was founded in the principles of the 1938 Social Security Act, and this uh, was 10 years ahead of the attempt here to create a national health system. We never quite got there because of um, uh, debates that took place between the government and the very powerful at the time medical profession, meaning a compromise was made so we got the free public hospitals, uh, sort of a national system of public hospitals you might say, uh, and any public hospital employee was salaried, including doctors and nurses and so forth, uh, but the GPs, who like the UK, are all in private practice, retained the right to charge patients. So any patient now who sees a GP will be billed. So this is a major diversion from the UK NHS model. I presently pay about £20 to see a doctor. Uh, that's about the highest rate we pay, but many New Zealanders pay that rate. And uh, then there are various subsidies, meaning that others would pay less. But there is always an expectation in the way in which GPs are funded. They get about half their funding from government sources, and the other 50% comes, roughly speaking, from patient feeds direct at point of service. We are the only country in the world that has a democratic governance model, and this is expressed through 20 district health boards, which are like 20 local planning and commissioning organisations that also own and run the public hospital in their district. Uh, and now these are predominantly elected boards, and uh, they in turn fund about 30 primary health organisations which coordinate primary health care in a region. Now we have had, uh, compared with the UK, I think, fairly stable healthcare system structures since about the year 2000. These two sets of institutional arrangements have roughly remained the same, although some might argue that there's actually been a lot of reform that has taken place, and I could give an entire lecture just going through the various different reforms, but we are not on that topic tonight. So on to the uh, medical workforce and the role of IMGs. So, the medical workforce has grown since 2009 by about 13.3%. Um, the specialist workforce has grown at a higher rate through that period than the GP workforce. We continue to have uh, critical shortages in various areas, meaning that um, migrants who come to New Zealand, IMGs for instance, who can work in any of these areas get more points uh, through our immigration department and the doors are open. So if you're a GP, who is happy to work in a rural area, for instance, or a psychiatrist, uh, then you have a much more straightforward ride into New Zealand. Uh, of course, it depends on your country of origin as well. Uh, doctors from the UK have uh, the most straightforward uh, road through the Medical Council in New Zealand. Those from other parts of the world have to go through many more hoops. Uh, it all comes down to recognition, reciprocal recognition of qualifications. We have a particular need for GPs. Uh, there are shortages outside of the, of the Auckland metropolitan area uh, and of the other major cities. And then down the bottom right hand side, 43.6% of New Zealand's doctors, uh, the latest figure, are trained um, uh, overseas. 
Now, if you compare that to the UK, it's about 36% here are either European Economic Area Qualified uh, or IMGs. And the IMG category will include North America, Canada, Asia, anywhere that's outside the EEA area. So the role of the IMGs in New Zealand, um, as I said, is, is a very important one, and uh, it's been growing in recent years. And uh, 2009, you can see it was just over 40%, to now we're just over 43%. Their um, role is uh, disproportionate between the rural and urban areas. More than half of rural doctors are IMGs. Now about half of the currently registered IMGs, the 3,500, hail from the UK. So the UK is a significant contributor. IMGs, however, are considerably more mobile than New Zealand trained doctors. And the pattern seems to be, this is research undertaken by my former colleague, health economist, Rick Harris, uh, who has strong interest in this area. And um, they found that the typical pattern is that an IMG will come in to either rural general practice or rural or small town hospital specialist work. Uh, Post-registration, they then will move into a metropolitan area and or go to Australia first immediately or metropolitan, then Australia and then elsewhere. The data also show, and this has come from our uh, National Agency Health Workforce New Zealand, which is uh, a recently formed agency that provides strategic advice to the government around health workforce planning, essentially. Uh, and they've drawn data from the Medical Council uh, in putting this uh, nice wee quote together. North American and UK doctors are more likely to stay for a year or two, often alternating stints as a specialist locum of time after travel. Just 35% from the US and Canada remain in New Zealand a year after registration, compared with about 70% from Asia. For UK doctors, it's 53% only after a year, 30% after two, and 20% after eight years. The retention rates for all overseas trained doctors level out at about 30% four years after registration. And so what these figures really mean is that when it comes to building a sustainable workforce uh, in New Zealand, uh, IMGs are certainly not the answer. These are figures uh, taken straight from the Medical Council's um, workforce, annual workforce report, and uh, it's just to illustrate our numbers uh, what the previous slide was saying. Uh, and so you can see that for the local graduates, uh, within three years, 78% are still practicing in the country. Uh, Ten years out, it's still 63%. In the bottom table, uh, you can see there the, the first year and the second year dropping down 50, down into the 30s quite quickly. So a, a divergence, a very stark divergence in terms of retention of trends. Now the Association of Salaried Medical Specialists, which is our public doctors union, the Salaried Public Doctors, or ASMS as we call them, uh, have paid quite a lot of attention to this issue. And they ran a survey quite recently, which they've just reported in last month's the specialist, their um, magazine that goes out to the specialists, uh, some findings from the survey. And uh, they essentially asked every hospital department head up and down the country, who did you most recently employ into a vacancy or vacancies? Was it a local doctor or an IMG? And um, that led them to conclude that in major urban hospitals, it was more likely that it was a local doctor who was employed uh, and in uh, hospitals outside the major urban areas, small town hospitals, it was IMGs. And this quote here, um, sent on the back of one of the surveys, really sums it up. Uh, we are extensively staffed by overseas trained doctors. I'm unaware of any New Zealand trained doctor even applying to our department, at least in the past six years. So on to the research into workforce uh, migration question. And as I said, I'm going to very shortly present some research which I've undertaken into this earlier this year. But just to set it in context, prior research, uh, and there's a lot of research into medical workforce and health workforce migration, of course, and Jill and her group have done fantastic and lot of work in the social care workforce, as has Isabel. Uh, now, this is mostly focused, certainly in the medical area, on flows from the developing to the developed world. So Africa to you know, Asia, or Asia to North America, and so forth. And the predictors seem to be income, you know, better income training, a better life, and so on. Um, there has been very limited research into the 
flows between developed countries. And that which exists is largely EU area focused. So there's been a real gap, uh, essentially, in research into movements between the UK and New Zealand, and that's really what I've been trying to uh, fill, or making a start on trying to fill. Now these are the factors that, that generally uh, seem to drive workforce migration. You go and read all the literature on this. So there are both push factors, so uh, doctors, for instance, feel as though you know, they just can no longer bear to be where they are, and so they seek greener pastures. And then there are the pull factors of greener pastures, you know, better income, <coughs> better employment conditions, hope of a better life, or uh, promise of a better life, and so forth. And so the research that um, I've conducted, which is uh, in conjunction with my colleague Simon Horsburgh, uh, who's a epidemiologist and sometimes biostatistician, um, if he sees this on camera, he'll be very upset with me. I spell it sometimes BYO, uh, statistician, so it's a biostatistician. Uh, he says, no, don't call me anything to do with statistics. I'm not a statistician. I'll do your statistics for you, but uh, he's actually very, very good. So if he does watch this, he's a fantastic <laughs> statistician. <laughs> so, so we looked at these questions. What motivates um, professionals to migrate to New Zealand? What are their experiences once they get there? Why might why they want to leave again, given this high turnover rate? And then uh, it seems to me that there's a huge pool of knowledge potentially coming into New Zealand, as there is into any country, through workforce migration. How might we better capture this knowledge? So that's what we were interested in exploring. Now the methods um, were a survey and interviews. So the survey was by the Medical Council of New Zealand. Uh, they, they, they paid a very, very keen interest in this project and have been very, very supportive uh, and grateful to them for it. Uh, and so essentially we sampled every doctor or included every doctor who had registered within the last 10 years from the UK or with a UK qualification uh, and who was still practicing and registered in New Zealand. So there were 1,354 of them. We uh, got a 48% response rate, which for this kind of work is pretty good in this day and age. It's very, very tough getting decent response rates out of people such as busy doctors in this day and age. 97% of the respondents completed the survey in its entirety, so it's a pretty good data set. And the characteristics of the respondents are very, very close to the larger sample. So we feel as though it's not necessarily biased, sampling, at least from, uh, from a, that particular angle. We uh, adapted questions from other migration studies, and uh, then I also interviewed 16 doctors, a mix of GPs, and hospital specialists up and down the country. Uh, and then some policy makers. So just going through some of the findings, this is a list of questions asking uh, respondents to rank how important following factors were in attracting the move to New Zealand. So you can see at the very top, uh, most important was quality of life or that of family. And you can see that uh, uh, about 60% plus, this was very important or highly important. More attractive working conditions, 87%. Availability of career opportunities, 72%. Personal and family factors, 71%. And then the desire to leave the NHS, the push factor, the disenchantment question. Uh, 65%, including about um, one third, who said that this was highly important. So what I'm going to do now is just present results of regression, uh, which we have undertaken into uh, various questions. And I'm just going to touch on three, three areas from that previous slide. So this is the quality of life question, which was 96% of respondents saying that this was important or highly important. And so the results of the regression suggest that for uh, doctors 41 and, o of, and over, older doctors, that this was less important than for the reference group, those aged to 20 or to 30 years of age. It was more important, however, for those with more experience, those with 20 or more years of experience than for the reference group, those with less than five years of experience. And then it was more, less important, sorry, for registrars who might be seeking a training place in New Zealand uh, than it was for GPs, the reference group. So these are all statistically significant findings. On to the training and development goals. Um, this was less important for respondents uh, 51 and over than it was for the reference group of 20 to 30 year olds. Less important for those 16 years or more work experience than it was for those with less than 5 years of work experience. And then more important 
uh, for registrars. Once again, those perhaps seeking training places in New Zealand where they might not be available in the UK than it was for uh, GPs. <coughs> so the question which I'm sure you're all interested in, the desire to leave the NHS. Uh, so remember that 65% of the respondents said that it was a driving force behind the decision to go to New Zealand. So the only statistically significant finding here was the group of um, respondents 51 years or over um, having um, placing less importance on that than for the younger doctors, those aged 20 to 30. So I'll come back to all of this in due course. We also asked about working in New Zealand because the migration literature per se tends to suggest that uh, if migrants are happy in their community, have a good life and a good lifestyle, they are more likely to want to stay in the country that they have come to. So we asked a series of questions uh, about broader factors to do with uh, lifestyle and the working environment and so forth. So you can see, you can see here that they're a generally fairly happy bunch. Uh, many of these questions are uh, over 90%, so getting along well with colleagues, enjoying the local community, having good clinical support, feeling that work is valued by the community. The New Zealand health system is easy to work in, 92% uh, agreed with that, uh, including uh, about 20, more than 25% strongly agreed that it was easy to work in. The workload is reasonable, 91%, uh, having good facilities and equipment to work with, integration being straightforward into New Zealand. And then the second to bottom one, which 80% agreed or strongly agreed with, including more than 40% strongly agreeing with this question, the New Zealand health system is better to work in compared with the UK system. And so that question, I'm sure you're all interested in more detail around that. So these are the results of the regression. So for male doctors, uh, they agreed more that New Zealand was better to work in compared with their female counterparts. Uh, those aged 41 and over agreed less that New Zealand was better to work in compared with uh, the younger doctors. And, um, then uh, the hospital specialists and registrars tended to agree more that New Zealand was better to work in uh, than the reference group, the GPs. That in its own right is an interesting finding which I'll come back on to shortly because GPs and hospital specialists have quite different experiences, at least in terms of what they said to me during interviews. So finally, we asked a simple binary question in the survey, yes, no, are you thinking about leaving New Zealand? Now, 29% said yes, they were thinking about departing. And so those 29%, 181 of them altogether, we then asked a series of questions for, why they were, for what might be motivating the desire to leave. You can see here that the um, top rank is uh, the desire to return to a country such as the UK, where I had previously worked or lived. Uh, and then down it goes. Career opportunities else, elsewhere seems a little less important, 55%. Limited career opportunities in New Zealand, only 40% citing that. Uh, more attractive salary and incentives elsewhere, 24%. And then down it goes. Better lifestyle elsewhere, only 20% cite this as a motivating factor. A poor working environment, only 15%. Uh, and so forth. So we can probably conclude that it's returning here is the main factor that motivates wanting to leave. New Zealand, as I said, is a long way away from home, especially if you're in Dunedin. <coughs> so on to the qualitative data. Um, so I'm just going to present a few quotes here uh, that came from different interviews that tend to represent what many of the different doctors have said. So on the motivation to move to New Zealand, postgraduate training came up time and again with interviewees, training opportunities that weren't available here in the UK, as well as lifestyle. And so this doctor here said, I was offered a training place in emergency medicine, which at the time was quite underdeveloped as a specialty in the UK, but well organised in New Zealand. I had a choice of locations, but selected Auckland as my wife and I fell in love with the city and country on an earlier visit. We asked ourselves, why aren't we living here? I'm now almost done with residency, enjoy the work environment, and find it much less stressful than I remember the NHS to be. We now have our first child with another on the way. We miss the UK and family, but would not want to leave New Zealand. The people are very nice and easy to deal with, the climate, the outdoors lifestyle, paradise really. The desire to leave the NHS uh, came up 
from many interviews and stress and frustration was cited several times by both GPs and specialists. Uh, these two quotes here come from hospital specialists. So one who only arrived at the start of this year said, the NHS was becoming more and more in the red. We were being expected to do more and more with less, so no resource but expected to deliver more. So tighter targets and community being told to expect more to the point where it was just becoming impossible and it felt like it was assembly like medicine. Pressure was extremely intense, and combined with a long commute, I felt like it was going to be quite deleterious for my psychological health and family life. <coughs> the other said, a constant reorganisation and a lot of constant directives coming from above. It didn't seem to really relate to patient needs, just kind of political objectives. And many of the interviews, interviews spoke about the reorganisation, constant reorganisations. Many interviewees, especially the GPs, spoke about the challenges of arriving into a new environment. And as I said earlier, the GPs have a slightly different pathway. Now, a hospital specialist uh, would usually get, uh, be given a relocation package, um, assistance with visa and uh, immigration processes, with medical council registration. In many cases, they might be given short-term housing, as well as even a car. Um, the GPs often will go through an agency, and do all of the other things themselves, with no support, and just arrive for work. Now this GP here um, really kept quite nicely, I think, uh, the challenges on arrival and said, I'd have benefited from some kind of mentoring or buddying program. When I arrived as a GP in a poorer part of Auckland, I was basically shown around the clinic, given a quick overview of the IT system, a prescribing pad and needed to go. I was given longer appointment times than the GP usually gets for a couple of weeks, but that was about it really. New country, completely new patients, new drugs and funding scheme for this, and this is Farnac, which is New Zealand's sometimes controversial uh, national drug purchasing agency, and an environment where patients pay for their 15 minutes with the doctor. It was all quite alien. Buddy in with local GP or someone who come from the UK earlier and been through it all would have been great, just to provide a bit of advice here and there and be a sounding board. Now, that doctor said, in fact, he was now very, very happy and wouldn't leave. He absolutely loved He was in a very large Pacific Island community uh, and absolutely loved the patients in the community and his work. But it was a huge challenge to set on the road. And there were times when he could have easily left. Um, now, I asked the interviewees to compare the NHS and New Zealand. Which system did they prefer working in? Uh, what were the positives and negatives of each? And it was a very, very interesting exercise in the time. I remember asking this question and giving reflections. And these are just some very, very short tracks from quotes. And these are all from separate individual doctors. So I think working conditions in New Zealand are superior to the UK at the moment. I enjoy working here and suspect I would be quite burnt out if I had remained in the UK. Another set of these greens are the positives. Um, patients here are more appreciative and respect you. People are generally friendlier and more willing to help each other out. Despite less resource, it is easier to get things done than in the NHS. Few home visits, longer GP consult times, less squeeze on appointments, more opportunity to perform practical procedures and work patients up before referring to secondary care. Anyone was a bit more balanced and said, overall it's a better place to work in the UK, but the New Zealand health system is not a bed of roses. Pharmac is more restrictive on drug availability in the NHS. Social support in the community is poorer. There are more co-payments that act as a disincentive for poorer people to seek health care. And then some negatives. Generally older buildings, limited prescribing options, still paper prescribing, limited IT integration. And then finally, uh, a specialist who said, I've been a specialist in the NHS for over 20 years. I had to work supervised for 12 months. The safety systems the Medical Council created are insulting <coughs> and inflexible, and they probably don't work. I have serious reservations about the culture in the New Zealand medical workforce. Very poor practice seems to be tolerated because of workforce shortages. Now, just finally, I asked about motivations to leave New Zealand. Very, very important topic, of course, given that turnover. Now, what came through often was recognition, in some cases it was recognition of qualifications back in the NHS. The doctor went on to gain an advanced specialty qualification in New Zealand, such as general practice. 
uh, but also the desire, of course, to return back home to family. So uh, one doctor said, the Royal College of GPs in the UK will not recognise any New Zealand training scheme for general practice. So on returning, I would be required to undertake further exams and assessments, even after completing GP training in New Zealand. So they had planned to return to take up a GP training fellowship in the UK. Home is home, said another, but there's a lot more, to, and there's a lot more to the world of the world that we want to live in too. We hope to return to New Zealand for another year, sometime. And then finally, we'll return to the UK for family reasons. All other aspects of work-life balance in New Zealand are better. Now, just very finally, a couple of minutes or so on workforce policy in New Zealand, which I've suggested here, perhaps provocatively, is a messy business. We've had a rather checkered history with health workforce planning, and dating back to the 1990s, when we had a, uh, you might say, a different style of government or governments, uh, there was a fairly laissez-faire approach to workforce planning. Uh, and I think it's sort of a, a, a rough and ready belief that this was something that the sector itself should do, not central government. And so it was left up to healthcare providers, hospitals, and GPs themselves to engage in any workforce force planning. There were a series of reorganisations of workforce planning arrangements within the Ministry of Health and other arrangements that were created. Into the early 2000s, advice was emerging from one set of arrangements in place at the time that a substantial increase in the number of doctors was needed if we were going to be able to sustain our healthcare system. And also highlighting the lack of coordination of health workforce policy. We then had a medical training board created in 2007 uh, that led to a doubling, essentially, uh, in the number of medical training places uh, with an aim for self-sufficiency uh, over time to the current 549 uh, students taken into both the Auckland and the University of Otago medical schools per annum. Mm -hmm. New Zealand still, however, has uh, less than the OECD average of doctors per 100,000. Uh, that's medical graduates, sorry, per 100,000. In the 2010s, the uh, current National Party-led coalition government created an agency called Health Workforce New Zealand, which, as I said earlier, provides sort of strategic advice to the government and the sector around workforce issues. Uh, but I think it's fair to say that there remains really um, a lack of identifiable national policy uh, around health workforce, and especially the role of IMGs and internationally qualified nurses, or IQNs, uh, as they are often called. The current scenario for policy, I guess you could say in speech marks, because as I said, it's not entirely clear what the policy in this area is, uh, is that um, IMGs really are, are constant. There's a general acceptance uh, that this is the case in New Zealand, and I think globally, it's just a part of the natural forces of globalisation. But therefore, in New Zealand, what we have is differing pathways to registration through the Medical Council. Now, for medical graduates from, as I said, the UK and other countries, the pathway is relatively straightforward and generally would just require, say, a certificate of good standing and some supervision. Uh, for other doctors, there are considerably uh, a greater number of hoops to jump through, and some don't bother to try and jump through those hoops and people will joke about this, that they become taxi drivers in Auckland going to and from the airport. Uh, there is a focus, certainly within the Medical Council, on orientation and induction and the hope that doctors will become <coughs> effective quickly after arrival, given the chances that they might leave the game quite soon. Uh, this, however, is largely left over to the employer. It is an, it is an expectation that it's left to the employer to orient and induct doctors. Um, there is increasing recognition in New Zealand that uh, we are highly vulnerable to shifts in the global uh, medical workforce marketplace. It might only take a substantial drop in the New Zealand dollar and a shift in the economy in Europe uh, for the whole playing field to change in New Zealand. It's a very, very complicated area and interwoven with political economy. Uh, government investment in New Zealand has been growing uh, into the training of medical, stu medical students and graduates. Uh, there are various bonding schemes and pathways to try and keep medical graduates in place. There is a vague aim um, to reduce the reliance on IMGs to about 15% by a certain point in time. So just finally, uh, a few very brief conclusions to wrap it up. So, 
Uh, as I've said, migration is natural to globalisation, so there's nothing new in this necessarily. In fact, New Zealand and the UK have a long, long history uh, of New Zealand essentially being reliant on the UK for its healthcare workforce. The very first professors at the University of Otago were essentially dispatched from mostly Scotland, but by the UK, uh, to establish the medical school. It was a long time before we had our own graduates coming through. Uh, so there's nothing new in all of this. The uh, UK, of course, as I said at the outset, uh, might be losing doctors to New Zealand at 3,000 a year, but they provide a lifeline to us in New Zealand. And the research that I presented here tonight suggests that they often also find that New Zealand is a better place to work. Better to work in than the NHS, uh, and in many cases they are fleeing the NHS. They go to New Zealand, of course, for work opportunities. Uh, this is especially a case, our regression analysis showed for younger doctors and for registrants. They also go to New Zealand, of course, for you know, the sun and the surfing at some clear beach in 14 degrees. Um, there are various positives to medical migration as well. It's not all negative. Um, healthcare professionals get a very, very important experience working with different kinds of patients in a different context. In fact, most doctors at some stage in their career will probably go abroad to work to gain such experience so they can bring it back home again. Locals, of course, a uh, national government or a local healthcare provider system uh, also has the capacity to draw knowledge from the IMG workforce. Now, this is an area which, as I said, I've been very interested in exploring. We don't necessarily have a method for it yet in New Zealand. There are various potential options, uh, and I will be looking to outline some of those in my next lecture on the 18th of uh, November. This is the plug. Uh, at uh, NHS employers in Leeds. So you're welcome to get on the train with us up to Leeds on that day. And back to London again on the same day as well, I think. So thank you very, very much for listening and we'll greatly look forward to uh, the rest of the discussions and then questions and answers in due course. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robin, for an extremely interesting presentation. I'm sure a number of you have got questions you'd like to um, address to Robin. We'll have uh, two responses now. Um, firstly, from Professor Jill Manthorpe, and then secondly, Professor Stephen Back. And then uh, we'll have a discussion, uh, where, which will be an opportunity to ask uh, questions to all our speakers. Just to briefly introduce Jill, um, Jill is Professor of Social Work at King's and Director of the Social Care Workforce Research Unit here, and a National Institute of Health Research Senior Investigator Emeritus. She's involved in advisory work for the Department of Health, as well as working uh, closely with social care employers to link research uh, and practice. And among the numerous uh, studies uh, on the social care workforce that Jill is involved in, she's recently carried out research on the migrant social care workforce in England. Thank you, Jill. Good. Thank you, Isabel. And um, it's a good evening or good afternoon, everyone. You can't tell it's here, can you? It's, um, it's the aptly named Anatomy Theatre. So I'm going to focus on the social care workforce, which is about 1.8 million people in England at the moment, give or take a few hundred thousand, and give or take a few hundred Few, uh, many thousand, a number of them are migrant workers, and I think a lot of interest has been around that area. I'm going to be looking at um, social care workforce migration, really asking whether it's a problem or it's a solution, um, and addressing some of the findings from research that we've done at our unit over the years, probably about 10 years now, a lot of our studies have noticed and have highlighted migrant social care workers and um, made some suggestions about ways in which they were treated and a way in which they treat the people that they're working with. Um, this draws on a number of presentations and colleagues' work in particular, rather than my own. Um, I'm just going to comment for a little bit about how social care workforce in the UK differs from healthcare. Um, and there is a very nice clip art picture of somebody really trying to decide what is the difference between an apple and an orange, as you can see here. Um, I'll just touch on some of these as I go through, but really to say there are lots of long, um, long-standing issues of migration, both in New Zealand but also in the UK. Big change for us, though, here has been the move to the, um, the movements within the EU, as everybody recognises in the news currently. Um, we're understanding a lot more about motivations, which is great because we really didn't understand much about people working in social care workforce a 
until then. And um, sometimes we think it's a problem, sometimes we think it's a solution, and sometimes we don't really know whether we're addressing one or other. So I'm going to address some of those points. Of course, there are um, differences. Um, immigration, emigration depends where you're standing, where you're from, and obviously there's a lot of internal immigration and emigration and movement, as we might call it, within the UK. However, the health sector differs from social care in being much more highly regulated. We also are beginning to get data now of what it feels like to be a patient of all these people when people say, I'm really here for the holiday or something like that or the sunshine or something. What does it feel like to be a patient or a family member when somebody tells you they're just passing by? Uh, maybe you're, it's great because they've got new skills or do you really feel, well, I'd quite like to see the same person next week? We're going to be talking about that funny sociological word agency, about having agency, the ability to decide what we want to do, but also in this context, and Robin mentioned, employment agencies. Are they good? Are they bad? Do they exist? Um, now they're on the web, where can we find these places? And talking about planning and lack of planning, so there's a great deal of commonality there. And again, asking what are the problems and solutions around these topics. I've got 15 minutes, I could speak till Christmas, um, but I'm going to apologise and say I'm really not going to focus on the professions such as social work and occupational therapists. I'm going to be talking about people who do what's called hands-on care. So they work with people in their own homes as home care workers, or they work in care homes as care assistants or senior carers. And here's just to say that immigration and emigration are not uh, a current obsession in the UK. Here is a picture of people in, from New Zealand and saying, are you employing migrant workers in aged care? Uh, we don't quite use that term, but it's a very familiar picture, isn't it, of somebody uh, being, being taught uh, or being shown a care plan or maybe uh, their wages. And here's somebody doing a rather um, interesting presentation, Sandra Cuban, who looked at uh, work in um, the northwest of England, but is now looking at Mexican and American immigrants in social care and the difficulties that they have as cross-border work. As she, clearly, she too has migrated to the States in this um, catch-up. I'm just going to mention long-standing things. One of the great joys of being an academic is that you can read any novel you like and really tell people that it's about the work you're interested in. So we can all sit there and read um, uh, Jennifer Worth's um, maternity books, but I do commend to you one called Shadows of the Workhouse, because that's about um, workhouses that when, after the Second World War, they immediately, uh, a lot of them were relabeled into part three old people's homes, um, with not a great deal of change sometimes. When you read that in depth, you suddenly realise that workhouses and these very early local authority care homes were staffed by migrants. So there are stories in here and accounts from Indian care home workers staffing these places probably because nobody else wanted to work in the workhouse. It, it, talking of stigma was acute there. And then just uh, you'll realise then in the UK there's a national obsession with upstairs, downstairs, servant classes. And just to point out that um, the UK had been a great exporter of um, cooks and um, cleaners and nannies and so on, but also a current importer as well, a long-standing importer of people to provide domestic labour, domestic service, a lot of which has been childcare, but equally to uh, the person who is looking after various dowagers in downtown Abbey is probably a migrant care worker relabeled now, um, particularly if you look at the Irish. <laughs> Um, and here is another novel you don't need to be criticised for reading if you're looking, if you're having a nice trip. Um, a story about contemporary changes in migration because of the expansion of the EU. So replacing that colonial aspect and colonial global exchanges by EU. And this is a story by, about somebody who comes over as um, a cook and a gardener but ends up working in a care home. And it's, um, he's Polish, so first, uh, first here is the gender, how interesting it is that we're having men working in social care, very unusual in the UK, um, and this concept <laughs> of open borders. It's really um, very large, but in social care, we still have a tremendous amount of people from India and the Philippines and indeed South Africa. And there are issues that I'm sure Stephen perhaps will address later on about really the ethics of drawing people from places where they too are very short of workers um, and, when, and bringing them over to the UK and other developed countries. Equally, I suppose, we're learning now that just care, care work has various hierarchies. You can be a care worker working very long hours with um, a very emotionally draining, physically hard work. You can also be a care worker where it is rather nice and you have lots of time off 
and um, your page of Learn English and so on. We have very little understanding of that, but we are learning quickly that just to say you work in social care covers a multitude of activities. And then picking up on Robin, what Robin said, it's unclear when we talk about migrant care workers in the UK whether or not we're meaning people who are here temporarily or um, maybe think they're temporarily here or in here for the long haul, particularly from Europe where EasyJet and Ryanair are providing uh, really um, the ability for people to do very long shifts perhaps and then to go back home. And um, our studies have shown that sometimes people are doing that, they're cramming work into one period and then going back for the rest of the week to east, other parts of Eastern and Central Europe. We're trying to, do, to sort out the statistics there because there's nothing like a good overhead with a few bar charts on um, and I'll show you one later. It is difficult of course talking about care because there's so much that's under the radar. There are collections of data about care workers as everybody would know but a lot of them aren't filled in uh, completely and some of them don't apply. So if you and I put an advert out in the supermarket look, asking for somebody to look after us uh, when we need support. We're never going to really be captured by that sort of data and probably Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs aren't going to get us either. So here's a slide, and thanks, thankfully um, available through us through the huge national minimum data set for social care that my colleague Joe Marinati has completed for us on a very recent snapshot of the workforce showing a number of things. We wanted to point out dementia because that's such a political um, imperative at the moment. It's quite interesting to think if there is much difference. There isn't. Um, I think that's again something we want to resist now. Dementia is not different from many parts of social care in terms of its workforce pressures, um, the needs of people, the high level of needs of people and the emotionally and physically draining work it is. Um, you can see the big challenge for everybody is the grey bit which is we don't know and that makes it very difficult. So work that talks about there's 20% of migrants in social care is probably sort of right. Um, it's as good as we'll get. Obviously this is hugely variable. If you live within the M25 corridor, you'll get homes where the majority of staff are migrant workers. If you live in the northeast of England, perhaps, where there is a very high level of, of unemployment, maybe very few, variable. But you can see that there are an um, increasing number of people from the um, European Economic Authority, but also from other countries, mainly through visas, work programmes, or with other curious sort of entitlements. And here is one of them, the person who is described as being a working holiday maker. There's probably a bit of a contradiction in terms, isn't it? Actually, if you're on holiday, you're probably not working. Um, but this is describing that um, sort of shuttle approach. Here is an extract I took from the internet, which is always a great source of academic expertise. I won't tell you which website it was, I look, but I did look at Gumtree, because my children tell me that's the sort of fount of all knowledge now. Yesterday, you'll be very pleased to know, if you're looking for work, that there are 1,038 vacancies for care workers on Gumtree, and a lot of those seem to be very well paid. I'm not quite sure about that myself, but it was a, there are a lot of work there. And here is one company that was established in 1962. So this is long before um, we voted, as we did, to, um, to go into the European Union. It is long-standing the way in which people have moved to the UK to do care work, providing regular and rewarding work for working holiday makers, short and long-term live-in care jobs. And that, I think, are, these are a group of people we hear very little about, people mm -hmm. are living in. And we might be used to au pairs and nannies, but that idea that there are people living in the houses of very vulnerable people often gives them, people like social workers, um, a little bit of a sort of chill because they don't know what's happening there. But it is a group about which we know nothing, but we know there are many of them. Great way to discover London and the UK. These are, this is what they advertise it as. Um, what can you expect from working for us? You can expect um, a little bit of induction. Um, you can expect to be told how to um, fill in your tax and national insurance, but you will be self-employed, and um, you can be you are going to be part of this great care agency. This you would be pleased to know. This um, advert told me where the local contacts were, and they are in South Africa. This is not for working holidays for people in New Zealand, Australia. It's for people who are going to perhaps leave their families, come over, work, and then go back home, and other people will look after their own relatives. Our colleagues, really, we have a programme of visiting international researchers in residence 
as I would hopefully call them, um, is, uh, is also pointed out new horizons. And a lot of people, working holidays or not, want to do jobs that will fit in with family life. And they, for them, their family can be well cared for back at home. Uh, that means that they can come and do live-in care and work 24-7 in a way um, to get that to job there. As I've said, they're under the radar. There's no regulation. It's very much a grey economy. Um, they might be asked to provide a police check, but our own research on police checks shows how variable that is. It appears to be whether or not you've got parking fines in some areas to whether or not um, you've really um, committed mass murder in others. So um, police checks are not all they might be in, in other places. It's direct and indirect employment. Gumtree advertises people directly saying, please, um, I, um, this is an advert about my mother, my parent, my sibling, quite a few of them for disabled children, not necessarily through an agency. And this, of course, does lead to huge concerns about the vulnerability of the individual care worker, but also of the people that they're caring for. Um, the vulnerability is on both sides of the coin. And here is another extract from um, an agency that uh, you might want to sign up with if times get hard, uh, because partly it has its own hostel, not for care users, but for care workers. So when people fly in, or when they're between jobs, they can stay in the company's hostel in a rather nice market town in the east of England. Um, Emphasising, I chose this quote really to say, you are not an employee, you are self-employed, and all the risks and the uh, onus that's placed on people to do this. Of course, in the UK, um, while everybody loves self-employment, there is one particular part of government which does not, which is um, Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, because it does feel that certain monies will never, it will never see much again. Uh, when you're self-employed, you'll be paid directly by the client, and there are adjustable scales of difficulty of client, and you must sort out your tax and national insurance. We want nothing to do with it. So a great deal of pressure there about insurance, obligations, rights and responsibilities, no access to employment tribunals, anything of that sort, because you're in a different ball game. So what's, a, what's the problem then? Is there a problem with all this in the UK? Clearly for many people in the, uh, in the care world, our own families and people we care about, migrant workers have plugged the gaps that it has been possible for some people to, um, to, to work in care. Many of them skilled, motivated, and compassionate. They're kind people. We've got care certificates on the horizon going for um, to say that people should have English language, and there's been greater interest in, um, in care work through migrants, I think, as well as choice for families. So, is there a solution? Well, for us with an interest in social care workforce, migration exposes some of the fundamental tensions and problems of social care. It isn't just about migration. These are about terms and conditions, about the status, the image, and the rewards of this work. It brings out that issue, should you be regulated um, or not if you work in care? I know that you and I know that if we go to a nightclub, as if um, the bouncer there is more regulated than the person looking after our grandparents. Should, is this right? The daughter and son test, the things we think should apply, as well as the mum test, is it good enough for my mother to go into that unit? Well, is it good enough for my daughter and my son to work there too? And lastly, as I've tried to just emphasise, the vulnerabilities are not necessarily social care related. They're tied up with all other things that once you open this box, you get a range of issues about domestic slavery, which is um, top on the list for many people in the Home Office, exploitation on both sides of the coin, and lastly, of course, with the parts that Ron talked about, about that acculturation process that many of us and many of our families have gone through when we're going to work abroad, but also when we've experienced people with whom we work. So I'm going to stop there in this ruffle spot door. I've got to say um, acknowledgements to all my colleagues who helped me with this work and to say that um, December the 18th is International Migrants Day, so keep an, an eye out for what's happening around that. And of course, everything I say is not the responsibility of the Department of Health, but quite often the things they don't say are my, aren't my responsibility either. So thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Our final speaker, uh, Stephen Back, will pick up on the wider context of international migration of healthcare workers. 
Stephen is Professor of Employment Relations at King's and is a leading scholar on international migration and the healthcare workforce and more widely on public services workforce uh, and its changing roles. His recent books include Modernisation of the Public Services and Employee Relations, Targeted Change, and he's also a contributor to the book Who Needs Migrant Workers on Healthcare Workforce Migration. Stephen has acted as an advisor to the International Labour Organization, the OECD, and the World Health Organization, amongst other bodies. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks very much, and I will endeavour to, to keep to time. I mean, I think, Robin, what you said at the beginning, or, or a lot of your talk, I think really connects with some of the things that I want to explore. Um, I mean, firstly, the theme of workforce planning, and the, I think you were quite polite in front of the High Commissioner, um, uh, you know, about the mess, and I've got some rather evil quotes from the UK about that as well. I mean, dissatisfaction with the NHS, again, I think that's an important connection that we might explore. And about, you know, you talked about retention as, as, as well. So, you know, these are all issues that I think, you know, connect the three sessions together today. So what I'm going to do uh, in sort of 10, 15 minutes or so is really, uh, perhaps quite crudely at the time, I'm really going to make an argument and, uh, about nurse migration to the UK. And that really is the, the, the conclusion that we've gone from boom to bust, perhaps to boom uh, again. And I think where you were looking through the telescope in terms of doctors from the UK coming to New Zealand, I want to turn the telescope round and look at flows of nurses in particular to the UK. So I'm going to focus, as I said, on that, perhaps on that, that middle issue about from boom to bust to boom. And as Jill has already pointed out, uh, I think similar thinking, when we think about migration, it's not a, a, a new thing. Uh, particularly in the health service in the 1950s and 60s, there was active recruitment in the colonies to bring nurses to the UK. But what was distinctive about that experience compared to more recent experience is that these nurses received training, whilst now we're recruiting already qualified nurses. And secondly, what I think is similar to the current experience is nurses were often channeled into the worst specialties, night shifts, the worst, had the worst working conditions and worst shifts. So elements of change but also <coughs> elements of continuity. As Robin has already said, this is uh, World Health Organization data, the UK is very dependent on overseas uh, born, in this case, uh, health professions, professionals. You see, the, uh, particularly amongst medical staff, uh, about 35%, and amongst nursing staff has actually increased quite significantly in the last 10 to 15 years or so. Okay, so one way that we often look at trends in nurse migration is to look at professional registration. In other words, if you want to work as a nurse in the UK, you need to be registered in the UK. And here we see, this is a really interesting, here if you like, the boom and bust. Um, because here we see that at the peak in this boom, at 2002-03, the number of internationally uh, trained nurses registered in the UK exceeded the numbers of nurses being registered that were actually trained in the UK. And as you see, it then fell off quite significantly, and now we seem to be in another upturn in terms of internationally recruited nurses and a bit of a downturn in terms of UK trade. So briefly on the, the boom, the basic story here is, and I was doing field work uh, you know, five, six, seven years ago, the new Labour government invested heavily in the workforce to, it takes three years to train a registered nurse, where was that pipeline going to be filled from? And it was basically filled from overseas nurses. 
And as one nurse director said to me in one of my interviews, I think fairly succinctly, there was a gap in the workforce, it was a quick fix option, and particularly with some nationalities, we thought they would actually stay. So this, if you like, was the first, or not the first, but a boom through to around 2005, 6 and very active recruitment. Then we had, if you like, the bust. Um, NHS trusts were, um, there was over-recruitment, and linking to Robin's theme, here we had a very health, critical health committee report basically saying that there is no workforce planning or it's been a total disaster. There's just been complete over-recruitment of nurses and also medical staff. But then the government slammed on the brakes because of deficits, hospitals wanting to uh, gain more foundation status. And also, I think, interestingly, as, as Jill uh, alluded to, the kind of increasing political sensitivity of international recruitment and concerns about brain drain and poaching from other countries. However, I think one of the interesting aspects of this is unintended consequences. So when the NHS was recruiting heavily in 2005-06 or, or earlier overseas nurses, of course it stopped newly qualified nurses um, getting jobs in the NHS, and they tend to exit the NHS, of course, storing up problems which we're now seeing. So unintended consequences of uh, overseas recruitment as well, as well as the positives we need to consider. Okay, bringing the picture up to date, we're now, as, as the cliche goes, in an era of, auster of austerity. And you might think, well, then why am I arguing that we might be entering another boom, or a, a boom left, perhaps, in international recruitment? And I think the reasons are really, uh, before I come on to that, uh, just to show that in this era of austerity, we're seeing big reductions in public sector employment in areas like local government, um, as these figures show, and in the civil service. But interestingly, at the NHS, since 2008, perhaps there's been a hiccup here, is actually putting on stuff. So despite austerity, the 30 billion gap that we heard about last week, the NHS is still uh, recruiting staff. Why is that? Why do we see this contradiction of austerity, but also recruitment uh, and, and a turn to international? Firstly, because we've seen um, short-termism. So the coalition government, uh, but also the previous Labour government, very much put the brake on nurse commissions as we entered the financial crisis around 2008, 9, 10. So again, the, 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 the domestic pipeline, the brakes were slammed on. Secondly, talk, linking to Robin's point about dissatisfaction, we're seeing a lot of uh, dissatisfaction in the NHS manifested around uh, pay freezes. L a couple of weeks ago, we saw midwives taking industrial action for the first time. In my view, it's not really about pay. It's about not feeling valued, deterioration in working conditions, pensions longer, having to work longer, but clearly dissatisfaction. But this is the crucial point about why trusts are, are recruiting more. Um, I don't know my audience well, but I'm sure most of you are familiar with the, the, the scandal and crisis in mid staffs Hospital. And the Francis report, with, with 290 recommendations, said that we needed to look at employing more registered nurses and improving safe staffing levels. So crudely, my argument would be if you were a hospital chief executive five, ten years ago, if you didn't balance the books, you were fired. You didn't meet your targets. Now, I think the zeitgeist, in, in a positive way, is if you, don't, if you compromise patient safety, if you compromise the quality of care, 
that is, you, you know, what, what you're going to get sacked on, you're going to get dismissed, dismissed on. That's the P45 issue. So let's overspend, let's invest in nursing staff. And that indeed is what NHS trusts are doing, in my, in my judgment. And of course, again, they're turning as a short-term measure to overseas recruitment, but in a somewhat different way from the previous boom. So they're looking to EU countries in crisis, Portugal, Italy, Spain, Romania, Poland, uh, amongst others. And of course, part of that is because, although we're in a period of globalisation, globalization, as Isabel alluded to, active attempts to shape immigration flows, however imperfectly, means trusts are looking much more towards the EU. Interestingly, um, more informal recruitment, trusts are also in, uh, recruiting healthcare assistants, often registered nurses who can't get uh, recognition in their own uh, country. Okay, so we're running over, so let me just highlight that this red bar shows this shift towards more EU recruitment amongst international nurses. So we see the, the, the clear trend there. Uh, let me conclude. I think I really want to make just one or two points. One is, to what extent is the NHS a distinctive case? One would think it is because, in a way, the NHS controls effective demand and it also controls effective supply through training and development. Um, so it should be a great opportunity for effective workforce planning. However, that doesn't seem to be the case. And there seem to be some kind of threats or risks. I think the political sensitivity of the NHS, the short-termism of the NHS, makes effective uh, longer-term or even medium-term workforce planning very difficult. What about globalisation? Yes, we are in a more global world, but I do think we need to treat this concept with, with caution. Um, because I think states still, particularly in the healthcare arena, a regulated workforce can actually actively try and manage and regulate uh, flows of NHS, of, of, of healthcare professionals. Of course, government sets policy, but it's actually employers who recruit the staff. So there's always going to be a kind of cognitive dissonance between the two. So what can be done in the last 30 seconds? Um, well, fairly obviously, we could scale up more nurse commissions, and that's happening. Secondly, talking to Robin's point, crucially we need to think about retention and return to nursing, which is very difficult for a variety of reasons. Thirdly, some other work I'm doing is looking at new roles and new ways of working in the NHS. Again, many challenges there. And finally, I think there will still be perhaps more sotto voce than, than previously, more active, uh, more, in, more international recruitment and to some extent active international recruitment through recruitment agencies as we enter another boom left, even in an era of austerity. Let me end there. <laughs>